So we've always wanted to do a podcast Mm -hmm. and something like this. And um, for anyone who gives a shit, because we're just two dudes with a microphone and a camera set up. Like like every Tom, Dick and Harry online at the moment. Yeah. Like anyone else that can do this sort of thing. So why would you care to watch? Well, all right. So I think everyone thinks they've got a really unique journey and I think we think the same. Mm. But I suppose as, as friends and as two people who have lived very different upbringings and things, I think the topic of discussion is going to be like men, masculinity, um, you know, the, the journey of a man who's got bigger aspirations would you say yeah bigger aspirations um because as men i think we all go through our own challenges um we all go through our own versions of wanting to be the best version of ourselves and there's for everyone for every man while everyone's journeys are different so many things overlap in terms of their the things that they find to be um yeah we come together and we unite with the same problems in a lot of ways um, and I think that's what kind of what we want to speak about. So if you don't know who we are, we'll do a little brief introduction. No, no, none of this like wanky shit where it's just kind of like we're trying to thief ourselves up at all. Um, it's where we've got a cigar. Like we're, we've both just recently taken a liking to cigars. Yeah. We, don't, we haven't smoked them much. We did a lot in Japan this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, that's what the cigar's for. Um, and this is, Coach, you tell the story. Your beautiful home as well. Yeah. So... Behind me, this place is the most iconic apartment uh, building in the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And for months, I was journaling and manifesting this type of place. And it seemed out of reach. It seemed too surreal to be writing down a place that was literally you could fish off this balcony. And the design of the place is just next level and I remember I was talking to Ben and I said I found this place I found this apartment and I didn't think you probably thought I was gonna be able to accept shit yeah yeah to to be accepted to to have it and I've always wanted to do something like this and live in a place as grand as what I believe at the level that I'm at but also just for what my ideal lifestyle is had looked like in my visions and now I get a chance to live and experience it and I get to do it with Ben and enjoy us really opening it's like an opening ceremony yeah it's just for this place it's just so we've always wanted to do this chat and we thought what better time than to do it now Kurt got the house I've come up to Sunshine Coast I'm from Melbourne so I've come up here to to hang out with him and it's like cool let's do this now because it's kind of fun um so short introductions to ourselves yeah so I'll go first um I don't even really know where to start, but have my own challenges. I've always wanted to be a successful person. I've always wanted to make a lot of money. And through that whole journey, um, I suppose, I, I now own an online agency. I do about 15, 60K a month um, in my online agency. And I live a really great life where I can come and do these things with my best mate. Um, and through the whole journey of, of everything, I've, I've learned a lot, obviously, about myself. But I've had battles with depression. I've had um, challenges with learning online business. You know, having jobs and hating them, um, you know, having friends and them not being the right people, letting me down the wrong paths. Um, and it's kind of led me to the position here now where I get to now connect and, and know who my people are, such as Kurt. And we get to do this together. And um, we'll, we'll talk about kind of like this is relevant purely because I guess if you were a, a young man or a man watching this now who's interested to hear what we have to say, then having a little bit of a backstory I think is relevant so um, I don't really know what else to say so it's kind of like I think we just keep this part brief because it's like yeah no, totally gives a fuck. No, one, yeah, no, fuck who we are. no one even knows who we are nah nah yeah but if you do when you're watching this and that, that's cool as well but yeah I think it's just just keep it brief but just, yeah I um, I was a infantry officer in the Australian Army I finished my return of uh, obligation my service time and I was a second year captain and I deployed to Iraq in 2016, came back, and then I transitioned out, became a life coach. Then I went into running a digital marketing agency, learning about automation. And now I run military-style immersions to help men break down and rebuild into the 2.0 version themselves so they can ultimately become a better leader for their family unit to thrive and not just survive. So the topics tonight are, are hitting quite home, uh, I believe, because 
dark times are here now for men, I believe. Big, massive downfall of depression, disconnection, masculine rage, suicide, I think is all on the rise. And I think it's especially hardest of all for men who've never had a true masculine role model um, with their childhood, but also because of what society is telling a lot of men and women about what it is to be a masculine man and to, I believe, what is a healthy family unit. And um, I think because we've had such a crossover of journeys that are so far completely different that it's an interesting conversation to be yeah. having. Yeah. And it's a healthy conversation because we do have different views in some areas too. So many different Yeah. Views. We have very different beliefs. We're very different people. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's why we're, we're good friends because we, we can understand that in each other. Yeah. Um, and we can, we can bring each other up because for all my drawbacks and all my strengths, we, we both have each, we can help each other with those things as, mm. as we move through, which I think is a massive missing part for a lot of men is community, but yeah. people who they feel like can, they can be safe in, in their, in their mate's company. They yeah. Like I'm being safe in their, in their mate's, um, you know, with with people who they genuinely trust. Yep. Um, I think that's a, a commodity now that's very difficult to have. So we met on a yacht of all things. We did we did a, a mastermind with one of our great friends and also amazing mentors, Lewis Mocker. Yeah. And he hosted one of his first yacht experiences for just his students. We were a student of Lewis's. We didn't know each other at the time, so we went on this yacht for like how many days was it? I think it was three days to Hamilton Island on the Impulsive Super Yacht. Impulsive Super Yacht for the yeah. Sundays. And I went on my own. Kurt went with his then partner at the time. Um, and we, we actually didn't really like connect. No, no, we didn't really connect at the time, no. but then it was after the fact that we did. But we had a great time. Yeah. But we, we, we connect after. And then Curtis's personality is very, so different to mine. He is like all at a gate, like 100 mile an hour at everything. And I'm very reserved and, and sort of quiet. Uh, calculated. And sort of, yeah, very calculated. <laughs> Whereas Bull in the China shop. Yeah, and, get out and of my way. I'm the, I'm the calculated one. So once we became mates, I had to learn his pace. And so the things we did this year were all because of you, really. Like I did a lot of stuff because of you. Yeah. Because of meeting you. Yeah. And... We we did a lot of shit real quick, and that's what that's why, like that's why it's kind of led us to this point. So we've known each other for a year now, and it's like yeah, wow, so yeah, much yeah. that year. So we did a TV show together, a reality TV show. It's coming out soon. We can't say anything on yeah on this. We then went straight from that to Japan. Yep. for three weeks, two weeks, three, three weeks. weeks, for three weeks, Osaka and all the rest of it, and had a great time over there. Um, and I flew business with you for the first time yep. to Japan. That was sick. Um, and what did we do after that? Then we had one of your... So, Curtis, tell us about your um, passages as well. Yeah, so we run um, a four-day military-style immersion. So men from all over the country will turn up and it's a military-themed personal development course and it's really challenging physically, mentally, emotionally. And ultimately, in the end, it's to help men really heal and un- uncover their internal roadblocks, their trauma, and, and fears, limiting beliefs, but put it in a, the context of something that's very masculine. And I believe the conversations and a lot of the questions from men and women that we're going to be talking about is how to understand what men actually need amongst other men, what's missing in society, how to hold space emotionally in relationships or how men process feelings completely different. So there's going to be a, a, an array of probably rabbit holes i think that we're just going to go down yeah but so we did yeah your passage we did that five day passage i'd never so i i I was a facilitator yep so i had a mask on and i mean i'm not an army guy right so like being thrusted into that environment as someone who was facilitating these men who were there to participate yeah not participate they're there to change their lives right and Mm -hmm. it was confronting for me and like i've been in i've been in yeah like football teams, I've grew up, I grew up playing AFL football all my life, so I've been to like new boot camps, that kind of thing. For that are hard things, but in, I've never seen. A, I believe you do God's work mm-hmm. in a sense of what you do for men, mm-hmm. um, and I've never seen an event like that before, especially being up close and personal with it. So yeah. I think it's a very different scenario to just like hearing about it so you see that you see the content page, yeah. you see the vsl you yeah. see all the content say this is the hardest thing you'll ever do and all this yeah. sort of stuff but until you're actually there it it sells half of it at at the most and so i facilitated with curtis and it was 
it was awesome. Yeah, loved it, loved it. And I was only there for two days out of the. Yeah, I know. I've had to leave. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was awesome. It was great. Um, so we did that, and then um, and we've done a bunch of stuff since. And so it's led us to the point where we've known each other for a whole year. We're we're, we're very business minded. Yep. We're very progression minded and development minded. <clears throat> we've learned a lot about ourselves through this process and and knowing each other. And so it's a perfect opportunity to start doing yeah this chat, so which is going to be cool. Yeah. So I hope you're still with us. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. So do you want to? Re- so Curtis put up on his Instagram story some questions about what people wanted to know, like know from what we wanted to talk about. Yeah. So you want to just like uh, like see what the question is, ask it, and then. We can both have our own opinion. So this is from Michelle. Uh, the first question that came through was, what do you each believe the top three standards every man should have in business and in life? Thanks, thanks, Michelle. Uh, will you go first? <laughs> um, I w- For three in th- business and life? I think the top three standards every man should have in business and in life. So we could do three of each. There might be some crossover because I think they're... You, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So I, I believe yeah. how you show up in business would be, there'll be crossovers in yep. relation, uh, life and relationships. Okay. Uh, the first one that I would probably say is it would have to be that a man follows through with what he says he's going to do. And that, if I was to put it down to a word, it would be self-trust. Trust in self would be, would be one. Second one would be honor and integrity. So explain honor and integrity. So honor for me, as an officer in the army, you would take pride or you'd feel honored to be wearing the uniform because you're representing country, queen and country. A lot of men, I don't believe, are are quite honorable in their approach on how they live their life. Standards of dress and bearing, how they take care of themselves with their hair, how they groom themselves, how they walk, how they present themselves. And... If I was to think about the honor amongst men, there's a lot of men who backstab a lot one another. So it's very hard to find a brotherhood that you can actually trust your partner with without you being there or to trust that whatever you say in the sanctity of the community is protected and it's not to have loose lips sink ships. So I think it's on having honor amongst men is really hard to find. Mm. Especially transitioning out of the army, I think it was really difficult because your life depends on the man next to you. And that's why... It's a, it's a family. It's a brotherhood. Yep. I don't think you can emulate that to the level outside of army or defense. Yep. So honor would be a big one. And then integrity, you have to be willing to wear the consequences of your actions and to be honest and open when you're wrong and admit when you're wrong. Mm. And fucking admit your faults. Yep. And I don't think a lot of guys do that. Owning your shit. They get, a, they get fearful that if they were to own their shit, they would actually lose the thing, the person or the opportunity. But by actually not living in integrity, they actually lose it because what they avoid will continue to expand until it's gone. Right. So I think that would be my top three. So what was your first one again? It was um, trust. Yeah. Self-trust. Self-trust. Honor and integrity. Yeah. And do you th- would, would they cross over with business and with? I think they would from a personal standpoint, but then for business, I think oh, I believe you have to be ruthless. You have to be ruthless. You have to be relentless, especially in the infancy stages of business. Mm. Like you can't be slow, and you you can't be uh, mediocre. Mm. You have to have a vision. So I think being a visionary would be quite big. A lot of guys that I talk to that apply for the event, you ask them where can they see themselves three years from now if you could wave a magic wand and you know, remove all the limitations and make it happen. Mm. They're like, I don't know. Oh. And it's like, well, how do you know what you're shooting, what you're shooting at if yeah. you don't even identify the target? So I think having a, a, a vision or, or, or goals would be really important in business. Um, I think how would honor and integrity, I think is do what you say you're going to do. That would be, they. I think they overlap for sure. Yep. What are you? Um, I was going to say, it's triggering me. Can you knock that one off? It's going to fall in your lap in a minute. Who? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I was I was thinking a little bit when you were talking, but I mean, all those things ring pretty true. I don't really, ha- I don't know that I have a 
uh, a top three. I think I think I've just got. I think I've just got one, honestly. What's that? And it's loyalty. Yep. And it's not just loyalty to a person, but it's loyalty to your word mm-hmm. of yourself. This is a great point. And it's, but it is loyalty to a person because I think the the loyalty aspect. I learned this off one of my mentors. Yep. And um, he's he's from Queensland actually, and it's something I've always carried with me, um, because I think it's very easy to. I think it's very easy to sweep something under the rug, or not say something to someone you care about or love, because you think it'll hurt them. Yeah. I think the loyalty aspect that has it has so many facets to it. Mm-hmm. And for example, I'll give you a really good example. Mm-hmm. We, one, one of your clients you sent to me <laughs> as a, like a digital marketing client. And yep. I, I do, I, I do work for him. And part of our deal together is I give you a share of yep. that because that's part of the thing. And it's every month. Yep. And I've never not yeah. sent you that share. Mm. You don't even pay any attention to it coming in. No, I don't because care. You, it's not that you don't care though. It's just that you trust me. Yep. And I could easily not pay you. Yeah, easy. It makes no difference to my life whether I do or I don't. Mm-hmm. It's at X amount of dollars, whatever it is. Yeah. I think that's the loyalty piece because I don't, if I just didn't pay you and I knew about it, it eat you up. I'd have to live with that. Yeah. Not you. Mm-hmm. And it's not about the money. Mm-hmm. It's about I didn't say what I was going to do that I said I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um. And I think there's there's moments, there's fleeting moments where you have choice that can make or break friendships, mm-hmm. relationships, any type of relationship with a person. I think it just crosses over into business and all that sort of things. And you can you can say all the fluffy stuff, whether it's business or whatever, it's hard work and all that sort of stuff. But I think that's just a given. Mm-hmm. I think if you really hold true to, if you hold on to something that is the North Star of what you believe, mm-hmm. I think you'll do just fine. Because I think mm-hmm. if you can have the integrity to stick to, okay, it's loyalty, that's my thing. Yep. And you can have that and you can stick to it. I think everything else kind of falls into place. Because if you have loyalty to someone, it, like someone where's, and Where's the drawback though for being infatuated with the idea of, of being blindly loyal to someone or something? It's not blind though. No. Okay, so when, when does then being loyal be a, a drawback, not a benefit? I don't think it does. I don't think there is a drawback to it. I mean, I, I guess you could you could argue that there's drawbacks to everything, but yeah. but the drawback would be only like if you make bad deals. So you're loyal to something that it doesn't. How do you know? Your life. How do you know it's a bad deal though? Well, if I if for example that monthly client that I send you, I say here you can have fifty percent, and I'm overworked, and I just keep sending you the, the money, yeah. and I don't talk to you. Yeah, that wouldn't be loyalty because it's just like burning me out, doing the wrong thing by me. Yep. But I I, I think that if you're loyal in the right way, so the fair exchange. Portion or the fair exchange, yeah. yeah. But I think the loyalty aspect in the right way is never misplaced. Mm-hmm. I don't think you can, I don't think you can be loyal to a fault. And it's like a, like a dog. If a dog's loyal to you, that's like man best friend for that reason. Yeah. So that would be mine. Okay. If there was to be two and three, if you had to pick two more, I think I think. The second one, I mean, I'm just trying to think back to, to my own journey, but I think, I think lo- like loyalty just stands out to me. And then I think it's just, I think it's just grit. It's just grit. That's what I meant. That's what I meant about rel- like being ruthless. Grit, you said it. Yeah. Like, don't be a pussy. Yeah. Do shit that scares you. Be careful. <laughs> don't be a pussy. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> But do shit that scares you. Yeah. Because that's where, that's where life is lived. as not in the safety zone. For the masculine, at least. <clears throat> well, for, for anyone. Yeah. In that, in that sense. But I think, I think grit in a sense of like, have, have the courage to like, and courage works into it, but have the courage to, to know when things are easy and make yourself uncomfortable if you really want to, you know, move forward. Um, I think, I think it's, I think it's, grit and I think it's I think it's knowing it's it's a knowing when you're you're relaxing and you're sitting back yeah and you're not you're not doing everything you can yep 
and I, I I believe that that's something like I always wanted to like when I was living with my mom, like 28 I was living with mum I had I had tried what felt like a million times to do business and get out of home like I felt like the biggest failure I had no money I had a car and a laptop at mum's place I was living in a spare room and I decided like I was defeated for a month like mm. it was genuine depression I didn't want to be around anymore I was done I was done and mum was hinting she was like you've been here for a while now like you're a fully formed man like I was so embarrassed mm. and that's where you have choice right yep you can choose to be a drop kick yep and you can choose to like I was when I Kurt when I say I was depressed I was it was bad mm. like it was I I had I had attempted things that would make me not here I, I had and and when I say attempted, I don't mean like things that like I, I had gone to do those things. Yeah, I had fought very carefully about them. Ideation, suicide ideation, it, and it was it was in the act of yeah. So it was like, and I'm okay talking about that now because it's it's something that is is not part of me now. Hmm. That that person never goes away, but it's not it's not something that I think about as often. Um, but at the time. You have choice in that top, in that moment, mm. and I think for a lot of men, even listening to this, if if they if they have that thought, you're not weird for thinking that. It's you're not different for thinking that. Yeah, it's it's more common than you think. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to make it seem like it's a pie in the sky, whatever. I'm just saying that. You so what got you out of it then? Because I've I've got a war. I've got an interest. I've always got this. I've always got this belief that. You have to get to a point, a, such a dark, deep point yep. of helpless. You've learned helplessness yep. so much that mm. you can't see the way out. And the only way out that people see is the opposite, like is that dark path. Yep. So okay. what was the thing that helped you then? Like, What was the turning point? What was the pivotal point? Because everyone says that like taking action or like breaking state and changing your, but like, your, your environment and your perspective and making that decision, et cetera, like all these fluffy woo-woo words that people talk about. But like there has to be a thing that all masculine or all men in terms of masculinity, because the next question will roll into this, yep. um, because the question actually says uh, from Amber, how do you cope with emotions and expressing them? Uh, what's your thought processes and patterns and the nothing space in your mind? So ultimately the what, what I read from that is, from a female's perspective, they process emotions completely different to us. They would seek help from therapists or completely different yep. modalities to what potentially might be more beneficial for men mm. to do. So when you had that dark moment in, in time, what was the thing that got you out? I, I got a two-part answer to this because that's that's is relevant. But the, the thing that got me out is it couldn't have got worse. So you had, you had to hit the bottom of the well. I had to. Yeah. I had to be there because what led me there was that I had I didn't have control of my life and I hadn't learned how to take control because everyone else had control over it. And so yeah. I had to learn how to have my own backbone and stand up for what I wanted and what I thought was right. And I couldn't do that in my through all my 20s. Mm -hmm. And so it took me to be at the bottom to learn how to get up, dust myself off again and have another go. And that's what I did. And through the through the years, I'd learned a lot of skills, and I'd learned a lot of things that would you know serve me in getting in the direction I wanted to go. But th the thing that I was missing was just the the grit I was talking about. To go, no, fuck you. I this is this is how what I believe, mm. and this is I'm standing on my own two feet and I'm defending now myself mm -hmm. and for my, for my own right. And that's when when I was living with mum, I was like. All right, mate. Well, you got two choices. You can sit here and be a drop kick, you know, go and in the spare room and you know top yourself, or you can go and get a job. Yep. This is three choices. You go get a job and go live with the normies and do all that. And that, well, I'd rather be dead than do that. <laughs> and so my third choice was, all right, we'll have another go. Yeah. Do this business thing again. Try again. Try again. And here we are. Now, now we're doing yeah. great. And it's like <clears throat> I had to get to the to the worst part. I had experienced the darkness to be able to move forward. I don't, I don't believe that everyone needs to do that. Not everyone's wide like that. But I think men who are pretty in touch with themselves get to a point where they think very deeply and 
they get to a dark place. Yeah, we're, we're humans, like women are. In all, what I heard from that is action cured everything. Action, but, but it was the mindset. Yeah. The, there was the choice. It was the choice. The decision to change. Yeah. And action. Yeah, it was, it was like, I'll give you a perfect example. I could have sat in bed, scrolled on my phone, you know, opened Pornhub 10 times a day, did yep. all that bullshit. Yep. But I chose to open my laptop, subscribe to Lewis Mock's Mastermind. School, Mastermind. School, of, School of Mastery, link in the bio. I told Lewis this on the yacht. I said, mate, you don't know that you saved my life. Yeah. He doesn't know. I, I told him that. And I subscribed to his Mastermind and I got into a room with, a room, when I say a room, I mean a community of yeah. people who thought like I did. Yep. And that changed everything for me. Wow. I didn't know that. That was when I, yeah. was, I had the 80 bucks, I didn't have the 80 bucks. Yeah. I didn't have it. Yeah. It was, it was all on fucking credit card. Yep. And so I had to make the money. I was like, my credit card bill was like 10 grand in debt. Isn't that insane though, that that's how, this is a one thing that I wish all men who apply understood exactly what you just fucking said then was you didn't have the money. But that didn't stop you yeah. because it was a must for you. Yeah. If you had no, if your life truly actually depended on it. It did. And that's my whole entire m- mantra that I live by is that if, a, if, if you had absolute musts in your life, you would do them. And because we don't have absolute musts, then it becomes an option. Yep. And if it becomes an option, then you will always find that other ways to distract yourself, distract, justify why you don't have to do it. You look to find other things that are priority. And then every time I've had like a money objection or something and someone says, oh, just I've got no money. It's like the reasons why you can't are the reasons why you must. Yeah. The reasons why you can't are the reasons why you must. It's like, great. If you don't have any money, that ain't going to fucking change. And that's a leap of faith. You right? have to yeah. suspend your sense of disbelief for this period of time to take action yep. to allow the momentum to build to yep. start seeing results. Yep. But we're so hardwired with instant gratification on yep. porn, um, Netflix, dating apps, f- Uber for food, where we don't even have to actually go out and hunt. Yep. We don't have to wait and stalk our prey. We can just have it on a silver platter. Yep. And I think that's the one threat that we have in society that men need to realize that the thing that's actually killing them slowly mm-hmm. is comfort and mediocrity yep. and the, the the closer we, we can live on the edge of our physical f- capacity to kill and conquer but to also financially because there's no there's no other village trying to take over your huts there's no saber to tiger jumping through our window mm. our threat is money yep. our threat is this livelihood or the lifestyle we want to provide for the family so People need to understand if you made an absolute must that your children's life, your partner's life depended on you putting down your deposit or securing your spot because you know you want to do it and that you must do it and you have wanted to over that time, then fucking just do it. Yeah. Because well, the worst thing that's going to happen, you would put that 80 bucks on your credit card mm. and it would have been $10,000 and 80, 10,080. That's it. And then you would have had the same interest rate of 55 days to pay back and you would have had to pay a bit more. Mm-hmm. But it's that leap of faith. And, and that's what I said before of one of my, that first pillar or that first key trait was trust. Yep. You have to not trust in the person or trust in the thing, but trust in yourself mm-hmm. that you'll be fine either way. Mm-hmm. You will. But when you don't have any other option, like you said, yep. your life depends on it. You, you, made a cha- you made a change. And I think this is most true for the ones, the only ones who come and see you, the only ones yep. who uh, would be even interested in watching this yeah, are the ones who want a better life for themselves. We're not talking about the dudes who are just you know, dudes or anyone that is just okay to just float through and just have the, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with that. I want to preface with that. There's not, I, I hate people just like, you're a fucking pussy. If you don't like want to be an absolute baller and an alpha and all this shit. I'm just like, fuck off. Some people just want to live just normal, happy lives. That's okay. Yeah. We're specifically talking about someone with, with larger ambition because it is crippling to have this mental, this mental, this mental state that is, I must always be better for myself. Yeah. It's, it's not comfortable because the only way you get better is discomfort. And innately we don't, we're like, that's not a, that's not a knee jerk re- re- reaction. No. Like you want to wake up here and walk out and you're in paradise. Well, yeah. Look at, look at Lewis. I love him. 
they're having an empty calendar and still running multiple six figures a month or whatever it may be yeah. where he does not talk to anyone wakes up has a, a beautiful baby now and then gets to hoist his own jet ski for himself and go on a ride and have breakfast alone and then come back and have to do no work except create content like that's the true definition of a true dream lifestyle and the only way he got there the only way <laughs> mate he work blokes a genius but yeah the work the work yeah and he's 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 so aligned with what he does how the, how how much though do you think childhood conditioning plays and your environment in your upbringing plays a part though in your desire for growth and and ambition and success because i remember every kid that i at school every every show and tell every conversation you have as a kid is like i want to be a scientist i want to be a national i want to be a firefighter we had no limitations on us as children yeah they were placed upon us by who teachers yeah and other friends or, or family and or m- mostly our parents our family members are saying oh you you should aim here don't get upset. Like you shouldn't get upset. Yeah. Settle for what you can get. Go to uni. Do something safe. It's yeah. like, is that, is that reason why everyone isn't so ambitious? Not because they don't want to and they want to live a comfortable life, but it's it's all that they know because of who they've grown up with. I, I think no. I think you're born with it or you're not. That's what I believe. And I only say that because I think people would love to have this. Most anyone would love to have this. Mm. But it's not about. And I heard this quote, I can't remember who said it, but everyone loves the destination. They're married to the destination, but they're not, not the journey to the hard work. Yeah. They don't want it. They don't give off. Yeah, they're allergic to hard work. This is what it was. I think Alex Mosey said it, but it was he, yeah, it was through the lens of somebody else, I think. But everyone's jealous of the outcome. Mm-hmm. No one's jealous of the work because they don't see it. Mm-hmm. And they can't feel it and touch it and experience it for themselves unless they can do it. Yep. And I think that's important because... I knew, whether having done it or not, that success, whatever you want to call it that, which to me was having like enough money that I didn't have to stress over just most things, like just most living expenses and yeah. I could afford a yep. nice anything, whatever I want, whatever I want within reason. But like 50K a month now it, to me is like covers, like it's a dream life for me, right? Anyway, the, 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 the example I was, I was going to make... What was I? Fuck, what was I saying? I lost it. I, sorry. I knew that that path mm. was going to be fucking hard. Yeah. And I was still willing to go blindly into it. Yeah. Why though? And to, to the but point, why though? To the point where I almost told myself. But why though? Why did you, why did you have so much blind, blind faith? Blind faith. Where's blind faith come from? It was, it's just in me. Mm-hmm. I just have it. Mm-hmm. I just, I have this part of me that, Go, I, I operate best when my back's against the wall. Yes. In the most pain, I operate at my best. Mm-hmm. If you back me into a corner and I have no other option, that is when I'm at my best. What happens when you're not in the corner, though? Yeah. <laughs> I will do nothing. Do you want to go to Japan for three weeks? Yeah. I'll, do you want to go to a TV I'll show? I'll do nothing. <laughs> I'm the laziest person by nature. We all are. Uh, yeah, but... On a different level, like on a, on a level of just like, like if you allow me, I will do fucking nothing. Well, the primitive part of us back in the day would have been lounging around in the shade until we had to go and hunt for food. Mm. That was it. Mm. Well, I mean, we have very different inputs now. But we, we do now. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's, 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 I know what you're different. saying. Yeah. That, that, that part of it. All right. So, okay. We'll talk a lot about me and I'm getting uncomfortable because I want to talk about you now. But <laughs> I kind of sit in it. <laughs> sit, feel it. <laughs> So, okay, this let's go to this question because that, that, how do you cope with emotions yeah. uh, or express them, et cetera, uh, and your, th- your thought processes and patterns and the nothing space in your mind? Okay, uh, this is good because I want to ask you this because I think you and I are oh, yeah. outliers to this. I think you and I are very good at processing emotions. Yep. I think we're very good at um, being intuitive with others, yes. emotions, like empathetic. Yes. But also I think that, like, I love this topic because I'm... I have no shame around how emotionally intelligent I am. Yeah. And how sensitive I am. Yeah. So I want to ask you this question. Okay. I want you to, to answer this one. Because I love this topic. How do I cope with emotions? Uh, I was never truly good with coping with emotions in a relationship setting. 
because all of my wounds would come out and I would just want to fill space with, uh, fill time and space with words. But what was conditioned in me through the military was being able to execute on a, on what was in front of me in a blink of an eye. Right. How do I process it? I would have to go back to what I got taught in the army was a commander's pause. That's what they called it. So when contact would ring out or, or shots would ring out and, and you would have this thing called the basic drill, which means everyone in your platoon would then go in all round defense, which means everyone hears contact left, contact front, contact rear, contact right, whatever. Yep. And then everyone would then adopt the prone position behind cover and they'd start to then scan and look for likely enemy positions. And if they then needed to then Drake shoot, they would then start shooting at likely positions, right? Until they heard over the radio. Just go shooting. They would, if if that was in their direction, that's what they could immediately return fire. Wow. So for me, the commander's pause was, if I went immediately, oh my God, frantic, I want to react, which most guys do when they hear something uncomfortable mm-hmm. or they're having an argument Depends. with their partner. It's like, I need to just do something because it's like, oh, it's right in front of me and it's a threat. Yeah. However, they always said, get down, pull out your map, pull out your brew mug with a coffee because you'd always have a, a thermos in your, in, your, in your webbing and then listen to the radio, take a breath and just wait. And that couple of seconds of just was enough for me to go, all right, what's the situation? Yeah. Situation is this, this is what's happening. Okay, cool. That's the that's situation report from the guys. Mm. Now I've got to deliver orders. So although I don't like to militarize my life and relationships, it's, yeah. it's very unconscious to still do that when I'm having a conversation with a, a woman and they've said something, immediately I just want to go and bite their head off. Yeah. Because I'm like, wrong. Yeah. But I'm like, hang on, I've learned my lesson now too many times of broken hearted and breakups where I'm just like, okay, clearly I'm fucking this up. Yeah. Clearly I'm not doing this doesn't work. Clearly being an army man in a relationship in uniform just doesn't work. Yeah. It might in some instances. Yeah. But not in an emotional sense. So okay. then I was like, okay, so what do I have to do differently? If there was a commander's pause in a relationship, it's like you got to really actually truly be more interesting, uh, interested in what they're saying rather than interesting. Just shut up yeah. and just listen. Yeah. And if you give them and you can feel into, and I think the point I would want to suggest is men need to learn how to be comfortable at holding the tension in silence in relationships mm-hmm. or in conversations. Mm-hmm. Sales calls are a prime example. You've probably heard some of the conversations. Heard once today, yeah. Yeah, and I'm so okay with not speaking. Yeah. Because it will make anyone feel so uncomfortable because they're stuck with their thought. They're stuck with what you've said. And as long as I believe you're the one that takes the lead in that in that area where you are okay with being the awkward one, I believe that allows people to actually vent and speak what they need to say. And most of the time, we jump the gun before we have all of the context. Yeah. So the pauses, I think, is super important. Yeah. How do I actually process it, though? I believe in a lot of shadow work is is required for a lot of stuff that men just don't even... Men probably don't even know what shadow work is. Yeah. There's a shadow part of us where it's the, all of the elements of the parts you don't want to look at yeah. and you want to just put it away in the box and never want to talk about it. Guys want to talk about it in your mates, you know, in a circle and you just try and change the topic because you don't want to talk about it mm. or you, everyone looks away and doesn't want to maintain eye contact. You can tell when everyone's like, I want to poke. I want to poke at that. Yeah. Because like you feel uncomfortable. Just before you're just like oh, I feel uncomfortable now. I was like yeah. I want to stay here with your question, yeah. not mine. Yeah. Um, but processing it, I think it's t- you need to take time. Um, there was the there was one relationship where I would always want to fix. As masculine men want to just fix shit, they want to yeah. fix problems all the yeah. time. I don't. I I I I don't know if there's an answer for why we do that, but I think it's innately in us, all of us. We just want to fix shit. Yeah. There's, the, there's a broken light. We'll fix it. Yeah, let's make it right, yeah. You've got a problem. Oh, well, why don't you just do this at work? It's like, babe, I don't want you to fix my problem. Yeah. I just need you to shut up and yeah. listen. Just listen. Just listen. Yeah. So when I've then understood that I want to try and fix everything, but they don't want to be fixed. What they want is to feel safe. They want to feel heard. They want to feel understood. That for me is then understanding that what I'm now being triggered in this conversation, I was trying to immediately go and, re- and respond. 
but I'm like, hang on a minute. I need to actually process where this is actually coming up for yeah. me. Yeah. So it's the I think it's the ability to look within that a lot of guys need to master and have the courage to actually look at it. Because when you actually look at it, as you've probably realized with relationships as well, I think majority of the time, most men realize that the relationship is the thing that underpins the success in their life and in their business. And if they just realize that their relationship is going to be a mirror reflection of what they had seen growing up with their parents then they know that the work that they need to do is actually within themselves and not on the person. Yeah. So I think for me, processing that has been my way of coping with emotions of understanding that it's never a trigger of like what it is that they have done. It's more so what they have then done to then bring up within me that I need to seek resolution on. Yeah. So it's never, it's like finger this way, three fingers pointing back to me. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, I can't be pointing all the time. It's I got to look back at myself. Yeah. Um, and then I think the flow on of expressing them, oh, how long do we have on this topic? Yeah. Expressing emotions, I believe is so dramatically different for women and for men and what we're trying to do and what they're trying to do, I believe is trying to box men and women into the same category. Same, yeah. They're trying to treat us the same. Yeah. We don't think and we don't believe and act the same. We might have things that align, but yeah, we're, one, we're big time genetically different. One hundred percent. Yeah, and so I think expressing a lot of men don't know how to express safely. Yeah, a lot of this whole idea and concept of talk. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Yeah, there's just fuckwits. Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree. Because a man who's toxic <clears throat> isn't in his masculine. The masculine is meant to protect. He's meant to provide. If a man is being toxic narcissistic abusive that's not masculinity yeah that's just fucking pure evil yeah it's just you're just a fucking you're just an idiot yeah yeah so expressing that i think for men men i believe express the best when they're using their physiology when they're using their words when they're using their body to be able to move the emotion yeah i think a lot of guys understand or they should understand now that when they feel emotion most people actually just bottle it mm. and they just hold it until they burst out in violence, abuse, drugs, alcohol, gambling to then vent. And I think that comes down to a lot of your childhood conditioning because the bottling part, yep, it could be part of your personality trait, but the bottling part is you've only known one way because you might have had some kind of upbringing that has fucked you up. Well, yeah. And you've only known to to, to withhold. Yep. You haven't known how to express. My dad was a prime, my dad was a prime example. He was... Uh, when they when I sep- when they separated when I was young, every time that I'd see them on like the week on week off thing, he'd always be drunk, and I remember so vividly I had a, the the um this uh what was it a I think it was a Samsung or or a Sony Ericsson flip phone with the aerial with the keypad like mobile phones you know the ones that you'd flip the screen up yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I called mum and I'm like dad's drunk again, and she turned back with her car. And I was putting my sister through the bathroom window to get out of the house because yeah. he was still, he was just out of control. He was just drunk. Yeah. And that was a frequent, that was a frequent, it always, it was just always drunk. So I have a real, I had a real big thing against guys who would just get absolutely blind drunk, especially around children. Um, however, I was, do you remember those little, um, those little jumpy little, when you're jolly jumpers, jolly jump. I love Mate, I was back flipping on that thing. Hundred percent. When I was when I was little, I was top heavy because my head was massive. <laughs> Mate, I was a bobblehead in the car. Like my head's still this size when I was young, but yeah. not the body. Same here. Yeah. Do we really? Hundred percent. I had a moon head, mate. <laughs> With Johnny Bravo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, Duff Man. Not as cool, but yeah. yeah. And um, I remember. I think I was like, what? I I remember I could draw the layout and the floor plan of my house when I was one. And I remember I said to mum, I said, my first emotion of fear. When I did timeline therapy and I did this process, I remember jumping up in this jolly jumper and I was seeing um, mum curled up in a ball in the corner of the kitchen with my dad over, over the top of her. And that for me, in terms of like violence with with men and women, that was, I didn't know at the time that that was fear. Like I was just seeing what I was saying. Yeah. So I think the conditioning that we have of expression yeah. is really... Deep seated, deep seated yeah. from our childhood, yeah. and I think our whole entire adult life is unlearning what we were taught to then relearn what we want yeah. to then pass as an outcome. Yeah, as an outcome, and um, 
uh, Aaron Sansoni said this, and his quote was, you either pass down wounds or wisdom to your children, and it's your choice on what you pass down. And I thought to myself, okay, well then I don't have children yet. Yep. That's why I'm wanting to do the work as best as I can. And I know I still won't have all the work done because only in relationships and then with children do you then have your greatest teacher by them mirroring back to you what you need, yeah, to, right. what you need to do. I think this hyper-independence that women are now experiencing with the rise of modern feminism and the men wanting to, not, uh, wanting to avoid relationships is because they think that they can do all of the work required to get to the fully healed portion. Mm. But the relationship has to be the thing that triggers you to get to that next level. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. We can, we'll always want to do as much as we can because we feel like we're not fixed or healed yet or with there's still things that we need to get right. But it's not until you have the other person to interact to be able to show you anything. The mirror. They're showing you up the whole time. And it's the same in business. No, it's oh my God. You're cl- yeah. This, this, this is what I think this is what this is the definition of being um what's the word for when you don't feel like you're enough to do something? Um you, uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you're you're in, not incapable, but yeah, it's like I, uh, the incongruence of like you you don't feel like you're enough yet to start. Oh, you're an imposter. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. That's the definition of imposter syndrome. Yeah. In a sense that if you're wanting to do something for yourself, like make money online or whatever it is, and you stop yourself from action yeah, because you don't feel like you, you, you're good enough, you're skillful enough, whatever it is. But the actual doing, the action precedes the clarity. Mm-hmm. And so being in the relationship precedes understanding what emotions, what things you need to look at in yourself. And... One of the things, like I avoided relationships for a long time, yeah, for the, for a reason that is what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, I didn't want to sacrifice everything that I worked so hard to achieve and to build, to build. Yeah, I didn't want to just hand that to someone else that yeah. I didn't think was worthy of that. Yeah, and not hand it like that's probably the wrong experience with it. experience it with you. I want to be very careful with and selective with that with that process, and mm-hmm. so I shut myself off entirely to it. Mm-hmm. But then, as I got back out and started to do relationships again. Going back into it after such a, like, it was a while. After going into it after a while, I was like, oh, all these things that I still haven't seen yet that I get I get to work on now. Yeah. That I'm, I'm like, like different insecurities come up or like, like different emotions about things come up. And the one thing that I, I've worked on, I really have worked on is expression. Mm. And I'm very good at it now. Mm-hmm. And I, I leave no stone unturned. And usually it's very uncomfortable for the other person because I leave nothing out. Mm. And I, I'm totally fine with that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's, been a, it's been a muscle that I've worked in business where it's like, I just believe in complete transparency. Yeah. Just talk about everything. Yeah. I used to, go, I used to be part of agency. Like I was, I was a stakeholder in an agency once upon a time where things would get left out for the better of the company, I thought. But as I thought about it, I'm like, I would prefer to just share this stuff because it's, it helps me sleep at night. Yeah. And I think it's the same with communication with someone. Why leave things out? Talk about how you actually feel in a scenario. And if you're like, I'm too scared to because I feel like the other person will see me, they'll leave me. Well, then that's the perfect way for that to happen. Yeah, they weren't right for you. They weren't meant for to that say. particular dynamic isn't right for you. Yeah. And mm. if you're too scared to see that, it's going to keep haunting you. And so, like, I have no issue with talking about stuff. Yeah. I give a fuck. Yeah. Like, I will, I will happily sit there and even to my friends, like, you know, you know this about me. I'll, I'll tell you something that is a potentially uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. Like, we'll have that convo. Yeah. Because I just want you to be better for you. Correct. And it deepens our friendship. Side note, side note, because I want that. This next question is great. But that's the one thing I think is missing with men in society. Yeah. Is they don't have enough courage to call their, their boys out. Call your boys out. Like I, you've spoken about it with me and with, with Dave before yeah. where we look at one another where just like, there's an, there's the always, and there should always be the underlying current under the table that you feel is there yeah. that like, we could fucking kill each other. Yeah. Like, and I've been around men yeah. where I don't feel that. And I'm like, you want to feel that? I want to feel threatened. Threatened, threatened for the, cap- the sorry. I want to feel that they have the capability. I want to feel capable around that capable men. Correct. Yeah, because it's safe. Yeah, it's actually safer to be around capable men. I trust it more. Correct. I but I trust that you'll pull me up. 
correct if I'm out of line. Hundred percent. And I will always do that for you. Yeah. If yeah, if I saw you like go above eight percent body fat, I'd say something. <laughs> Yeah, all right. I don't even know how to respond to that. But <laughs> yeah, no, don't. Yeah, but no, I think it's just, um, I if why would you not want your, why would you not want your best mates to make more money and succeed? I am, I, I am the first one to be like, can right. you please be better than me in every but, way so I can learn off you? Yeah, I want you to be. Yeah, like I don't want to have to give you the answers. I want you to work, learn them and then teach me. Mm-hmm. And whatever that looks like, I hope that for you. Mm-hmm. Like I feel that to my core as well. I don't understand that that whole. I mean, it's a different conversation, but I, like the jealousy part, I'm like, I'm like, I look, at, I get inspired by that shit. Yeah, I, I just can't wait for my friends to be yeah successful. Yeah, I can't wait. And the tide lifts all boats, right? Yeah. Like I've never right people though. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, but then others others will want to sink you. Like if you're my ma- okay, so if they're the wrong person for you, right? And they become successful, usually you don't benefit from that as their friend if they're not the right person for you because they're selfish they want it for themselves and I've experienced that before yeah they get ahead of you yeah. they don't want to drag you up yep because they're yep. the ego's taken over yep and that's something like that's where the loyalty I've seen in. I've experienced that too I've seen that happen before so many like money just money just makes you more of who you are I was yeah just about to say that they do the, it just enhances that. who you are yeah yeah. alright do we want to keep on yeah this there's, so <coughs> next one with Amber was uh Communication in an argument and learning to take constructive criticism and the love behind it. I haven't had an argument in fucking... Mate, I couldn't even answer that. I don't have arguments. Eh? Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll take this one. <laughs> I think argument... I think being argumentative is then another probably way of normalizing or, or debt softening that is having different opinions, having conversations for, with different perspectives. Yeah. Um, but I understand that what this probably, this question is coming from, from Ambar is about men not being able to actually have a, a hard conversation with a, with their partner right. where they are not actually attempting to communicate. Yeah. They're just like shut down, suppression, yeah. talk down, and control the relationship and not actually understanding that what they're actually wanting to do is give you feedback on where you need to improve. Right. So some guys probably get butt hurt. Where, and this is actually what I've said to all of the women that have reached out that if they want to come to the event, but all the partners of the men that come through the program as well. And I believe that men amongst men need to hold each other accountable, but by sure as shit, your partner should too. Your partner should hold you accountable. And Absolutely. when you're talking about she, we should be willing to speak honestly and if they leave that they're the wrong one, women need to do the same thing. 100%. And is there a, is there a way that women need to learn how to communicate to men about like if they've put on weight? You can't just say, hey, babe, you're getting a bit fat mm. because then he'll just turn around and f- feel that you've criticized him and he'll just go, you're the one that eats dinner with me too, babe. Yeah. Like, what come on. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? yeah. So I think for me, sidebar with, with women is I I think all men and women need to be able to love people through their um, insecurities to bring out the best in them mm. and to encourage them to change but be in amongst the journey with them. Because if you feel supported in what you're trying to do from your woman, you feel invincible. Mm. If you feel like your partner loves you as a woman through your own insecurities that you have where you see yourself differently than he sees you then you're probably going to feel seen and you're probably going to change and there's a caveat to this yep i think it's a caveat but we're about to find out the only way you find someone who holds you accountable is to become that version of yourself that is the best version the one that you have that self-respect you have that self-love you have those things in place for yourself usually you will attract someone the wrong type of person into your life if you haven't healed the parts that are the most outstanding that are causing you friction in relationships. So you generally you generally attract where you're at, right? Well, you get what you get what you need, and you're not going to have a, a quality person in your life, yep. man or woman, mm-hmm. wh- wh- whatever whatever dynamic you're in. Yep, you're not going to have that person in your life unless 
unless you've both done the work on yourselves to be able to come or doing the work or doing the work yeah, and, and you on have the journey high communication part yeah you're not gonna you're not gonna trust someone to grab I, I want a woman to grab me by the face and go hey I would have really loved seeing this yeah at this moment yep and I'd be so attentive because what what that says to me is it says there's something that I can help you with yeah that I haven't seen yep that is missing mm-hmm. I'd be like tell me everything however the unfortunate reality with that is when women with all the right intentions want to do that they don't actually articulate it in a way that comes across that they're not criticizing their man yeah correct they it comes across like they are trying to control the man they're judging the man and the man's like well, fuck I can't do anything right yeah fuck this I'm leaving yeah I'll go find someone else who's less combative or someone that would just Sit down, shut up, and do as they're told. Delivery and timing is everything. Correct. Delivery and timing. 100%. That's all it is. Avoid text messaging. Avoid text messaging. Yeah. Fucking have an in-person conversation or a FaceTime so you can see the expressions. You can hear the tonality. It, it, it's the way we communicate. Yeah. But I, I think for me, the communication piece in an argument is I said this. I don't know if I said it to... I said it to my guys in the mastermind call yesterday. And I said... You need to go into the conversation with your woman, metaphorically, by having your hands tied behind your back and giving her a dagger. I mean, sue that for a sec. Say that again. You need to go into the conversation openly with your woman, with your hands tied behind your back, whilst you've given her a, a, the dagger. Metaphorically. Metaphorically. Okay. Because... I'll sue that for a sec, because I actually haven't thought about that. Yeah. Because in the end, if you're going to go in... And not I'll give her the opportunity to fucking give it. Would you both have daggers? No. Why? Because that's not for that's not for you to do. So it's uh, in in the context of her bringing something to you, or vice versa. Because um, because men are fearful that if they then open up and express what they're truly thinking or feeling, that it will be used against them as ammunition later. Right. Which can be true. Can be yeah. Because they put it in a little lockbox. And they say, remember when you said this? And they use it, yeah. right? But some people, most people can do that. But what I'm saying is that if you need to come to them with something or they need to come to you with something, you need to shut up and you need to yeah. hold space. Hold space. But holding space means you're not responding. Yeah. You're just listening, yeah. which means your hands are tied behind your back. You can't touch them. You can't do anything, metaphorically. Mm. You can't do anything. Here's a sword. Go for gold. Here's a dagger. You, If you need to vent and you need to express, then do so. And the whole idea about this whole constructive criticism portion of the question and the love behind it. I've had previous experiences recently with a beautiful woman and the space that she has then transitioned from um, has found her relationship with with Jesus and she's on the path with him now. And um, her decision for what she's wanting to do is to be celibate until um, marriage Mm. was... The one thing she said that she appreciates from the work that we do and for what we've had conversations with is she had the space to, uh, uh, she had she felt that she had the space to feel her emotions in its entirety, in complete fullness. Yeah. And I think the one thing that women truly actually want is a container and where they can just be f- wild and free like the hurricane that they truly are, mm. which is the beauty of the feminine. Yeah, We try and go, ooh, no, 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 no simmer down like no no too much too much the reason why i believe it's too much for a lot of men is because they don't know how to do this yeah and i think this whole idea of metaphorically being like all right bring me whatever you need what's what's on your mind how are you feeling what's going on without even trying to fix their problem and just listen by the end of that conversation they may have stabbed you a few times but guess what you're wearing armor aren't you Mm. because you're impenetrable as the oak tree roots are so deep and the wind that they're trying to knock you down fucking good luck yeah but it's yeah i believe and this is the thing that i'm needing to still work on and i don't think anyone ever gets to that point or maybe they do is your 100 percent devotion to that person where no matter what they do and say you're not leaving yeah and i think that's probably the the connection to um blind faith and trust in god and trust in the, the universe or whatever that that 100% devotion is a thing that I think that's missing in family units mm. because it's so easy to then jump yeah. ship. It's so easy just to find something else. Find something that's less 
difficult and more ease of your on your lifestyle but deep down the empty hole that you experience is the fact that it's fleeting and i think i don't know if there's any truth to the fact that those that are a lot more religious in faith are the ones that are more in healthy relationships I, I don't know if that's true. There might be statistics. The there might be a statistic. Someone comment and actually tell us if there's a stat between that. But I think the constructive criticism, a lot of guys are just butt her because people in their life, they rarely have people who are fucking truthful. Yep. That is the one thing I really appreciate with our Loves with, you, with our sales process w- with what I do is that the call that we have, I am I am brutal. Mm. I'm ruthless because in the end, when they give you so much context to what's actually going on. They have never had a friend. They've never had a parent. They've never had someone that actually goes, that's fucked up. Mm. Dude, what's, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, you're going to lose your relationship. Mm. Your daughter is going to bring home a man like you because you're the example. Mm. Or more more importantly, the cautionary tale. Mm. Or the guy is going to look at you as what he can be. Yeah. And if they're happy with that, sweet, get off the phone. Mm. But if you're not, fucking do something. Listen to me. Listen to me. And it's uncomfortable, and it's and that's the, the the last call I had today. He said this is the most uncomfortable call he's, he's ever had, and I truly believe that that means that he wasn't actually qualified to come and spend five days with me because he couldn't even handle an hour and a half. So I think it was not out of criticism for me with him or anyone that I talked to. It's out of pure love. Yeah, and I think every successful man never builds anything that's not connected to some form of trauma mm. because they had to have b- built something from lack or from a place of moving away from pain living at home wanting to go a different direction you had there was no you had no other option except to find a way to make it work you made it work you've got now a great lifestyle and then what's the next objective what's the next mission what's what's the next thing to then achieve it's like well i'm now far enough away from my challenges and trauma and issues from my childhood and my my journey in newcastle and now I'm here on the Sunshine Coast. I'm like, well, what's going to drive me new forward now? Yeah. The events were doing well. We got to a really good point. And now I'm like, well, what's next? What's the next? What's the next? Uh, the next test? Because mm. I think we should always be testing. Maybe not looking at ourselves that we're never enough or that we need to continuously grow because we're lacking something. But I think it's just keeping your finger on the pulse mm. and having something to keep you like alert and and aware. And I think the All right, let's go to the, next the, question. the uncomfortability is yep okay. I don't want to off. Sim, sim it down. Um, we, we could we could just go layers and layers and layers. All right. So as part of like the next question, yeah, talk. It's it talks a bit about authenticity, and <clears throat> one of the things I really struggle with, yeah, from young, from Ash from from Ashley, yeah, as a, as a younger man, was around ego. Yeah. Okay. And I went through a big journey of like getting rid of that. Because it ruled my life mm-hmm. to the point where it destroyed relationships. It stopped me from learning things. It stopped me from experiences. And it was just the, it was just the absolute like destructor of all good things. And this year, probably more so than any year, has been the most of sunk into who I truly am and accepting who I truly am. And a lot of those things I didn't want to look at because naturally who I am, I'm a sensitive bloke. I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. I'm all the things I never wanted to accept because I thought they were weakness. Yes. And I know that this is a bit of a theme for a lot of men. Yeah. Because to their core, I think a lot of men are like this and they don't like it because they feel the same way I did, where they thought that their sensitivity, their emotional state, their way they felt things, mm-hmm. the way they felt in certain scenarios was weakness. And I thought that for a long time. So the ego aspect of me came to the front where- Well, our parents taught us that. <clears throat> well, the ego aspect of, the, of, that, of this came to the front to protect me. But what it was actually doing, it was making me inauthentic mm-hmm. and leading me down paths that I didn't belong. And this is what I want to talk about this because it's been the most transformative thing and it's bridged the most connection with the most people mm-hmm. who are right for me. Yeah. 
in every way, shape or form, because there was a lot, there was a big theme of isolation for me because I felt like no one belonged in my world purely because I thought that I was different to everyone else. Yeah. The black sheep. I thought I was the black sheep. Yep. But I'm not. There are so many people like me, but no one really talks about it. Social media is one of the one of the aspects, not all of it, one of the aspects that I think is pretty fucked up for this kind of thing. Because the Andrew Tates of the world, the re- the real loud voices. Mm-hmm. Like there's no room for weakness in a sense. It's just hustle. It's you know, it's this it's this inflated energy around masculinity that I think leads men down a really dark path sometimes. Is that because we are perceiving being sensitive and showing emotion as weakness and not yes. okay. But it's not though. It was true for me. Yeah. But that was actually my strength. Well it's I think it I I always say lead with vulnerability. Lead with vulnerability, but that can be a dangerous thing. It for who? If you overshare. For who though? For yourself. Yeah. With if you overshare with the wrong people. Yep. You leave yourself vulnerable. You can, in the wrong way. You can't. And you can get really fucked up by that. You can. And I learned that like I was oversharing with the wrong type of person mm-hmm. because I thought the people who were strong, who weren't actually, they were weak. Mm-hmm. People who were strong, who showed as the strong figures, mm-hmm. were the ones with the ego. And I shared my vulnerability with the wrong type of person. But wasn't it the right type of person because then when you shared it, they left your life? No. Right. They were the wrong person. Right. I get what you're saying. I get the analogy to that. Yeah. But that, that okay, maybe I had to learn the lesson. Mm, I that's get, what I'm saying. That's what I know. I get it. Yeah. But that was, that was the wrong person. I had to learn that lesson, of course. I had to go on. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. agree. Yeah. I agree. But had I of been able to work that out in a way that was healthier, I think I would have been, like it caused damage. A lot of damage. Okay. <clears throat> So I've, I've done counseling. I've done yeah, yeah, all the stuff, right? Yeah, done all the self help stuff. Um, but the the most profound aspect of what I've learned to this point about being being a man, being a capable man, someone who wants more for themselves, wants someone who wants to be a provider on some some form, is to be as much of yourself as you humanly possibly can, and to feel into that person. Amen entirely submit to who you are surrender surrender to who you are yeah and that can look like so many different things but I think the the thing that it looks like the most is usually the stuff that you need to look at about yourself is in the darkest corners Mm -hmm. and if you have the courage to go there Mm -hmm. the most beautiful things come from it yep and also, it shows you things that you might not expect. Because I found that once I was very comfortable financially, as an example, I was like, now what? Yeah. And I got lost. Yep. I got lost. I was like, had all this money coming in and I was so comfortable to the point where it's like, like there was no challenge left. And I was like, why am I unhappy? I didn't understand. I didn't get it. <clears throat> and it took me to realize that I had no, I had nothing, no purpose to challenge me. It didn't matter what that looked like. It was like, there was nothing that was like, there was friction against me for me to actually go into battle with. Yeah. The battle was me getting out of battle. Well, you won that battle. I won the battle. Mm. It was the hardest thing I ever did, but I won the battle. <clears throat> and it's led me to that point where I'm like, you know, the, the comfort is the killer. But it's now the authenticity piece is teaching me, like who I am is teaching me now that I have the comfort aspect, the the like things are things are pretty good. Now I get to like work out, like who am I, and then what fits into that world with me, the most. And I don't know really what it is, but I do know that like it's hard. It's hard to work out. But I think for any man watching this, is kind of like. They feel like they might be lost with purpose or they might be more sensitive bloke or a more emotional guy, whatever whatever that looks like for them. It's really leaning into this, really leaning into into that. Do you believe that you don't know though who you are? 
No, yeah. I think I've got a. Uh, I'm I'm getting a grasp of it. I mm. think I, th- I think you truly learn absolutely everything about yourself, but I think you um. But doesn't that make who you are though? It does. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because I think I mean, people can change. So is it the is it the pro is the is the problem more so not that men don't know who they are, but they just haven't decided on who they want to be. What va- what morals, what values, what boundaries, non negotiables, what like who they want, what they want to not be remembered by. But one of the guys is a good example. One of the guys had that question today, and I, and I said to him. If the past doesn't exist anymore and the future doesn't exist because when it actually arrives, it's now the present. And the only thing that you have complete control over is how you respond in this this very second. And there's infinite possibilities of what is happening right here, right now that could change with whatever thought, whatever feeling, whatever action you take right here, right now. Then wouldn't then be the simplest form of having an identity crisis or having this conundrum of like, I don't know who I am, then just deciding in this moment of who you want to be right here, right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're saying. Because then if we're focusing so much on the past or the future, that's where fear exists. There's no, there is literally nothing right here in this moment that we could fear because we're present. We're fully here. Hmm. And if we're fully here and we're like, I don't know who I am or who I want to be, well, who who would be the highest version of Curtis and Ben in this moment here, because yeah. this is the only thing that, that exists. Mm. Well, I'd be an attentive, very open-minded, and a person who's going to listen and take time to process what you're saying to give you a very respectful, well-thought-out answer, Yeah, which is what I want to then be known for with this relationship and also for anyone that listens, because that's what I want to stand for. Mm. That's the only part of my identity that I get to choose to create right now because I think there's an infinite amount of of decisions in the present moment that then over time based on then evidence that creates who you are. Biggest person that deals with this is us veterans. Identity crisis is huge. Yeah. Because we Identity is the veteran. I did, my it is now. My identity was jump how high sir. Yeah. Storm that okay great I'll do that. Yeah. Take him in okay awesome. Yeah. When do I need to get done by? This time back briefing on what you're going to then do it with your plan. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. No, no questions. As soon as you take the uniform off, you literally have well, yeah. the disconnection yeah. of no purpose because your purpose was to do your job. Yeah. And without it, it's like, well, I would sit and I would go, well, what do I do now? Mm. My pay in the army was always put in your bank account. They would allot all of your bills before you saw your cash. So everything was paid for oh. and you'd see a little bit of cash for you to the go and just splurge on the weekend. And that was your life. You didn't have to worry about anything. You turned up work, you did the right thing, you'd get paid, you'd have a job for the rest of your life. So there's no sense of free thought. There's no space for it. There's no room for it. You didn't have time for it. And it wasn't your, your job. Your job was just to do as you're told. Yeah. So I think the identity, that it was, which is what I had to battle through, was literally going, okay, well, who is the man out, so out of the uniform? Because he stands for all of these things that yeah. were the army ethos and the values of the organization that he then lived in for his entire adult life leaving school. And now it's like, well, then I need to build my own army yeah. and I need to have my own sense, you know, set of values and what's now my mission, what's now my purpose. And it's very t- still tied into what the military experience because I think every entrepreneur or every person who wants to hit coach or consult or run a business should do it from career capital. Mm. Hermosi talks about um, this is a full segue but he talks about you know imposter syndrome only only exists when you're actually doing things outside of your scope of what you've done Yeah, and it's like well if you feel like an imposter maybe you are Yeah, and maybe you haven't actually done what it is that you're actually doing I'm like that's actually true Yeah, I've never felt incongruent or out of alignment to whatever I've talked about or spoken or taught because I've lived it and I've done it Mm. and now I'm like I just want to share that but Back to your point about the whole identity part. That was just my question of like, well, nothing exists except out of here, right here, right now. Mm. And I'm like, oh, well, where where's the shift in us then getting to choose who we are? Yeah. Yeah. And I, 
yeah, I, I think, I, I, just, I think everyone's journey is very personal to that. Uh, yeah. It's, and it's 100%. just like, it's, my, my story is going to be so different to somebody else's. Mm-hmm. But I think the overarching thing is, it's okay to feel a little bit lost. You don't have to have all the answers. What do they say? Lost, um, lost and you shall be found. And yeah, and it's, I think it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that because I think this is something that I really despise about the personal development world or whatever you want to call it, where I was making content on social media too. Yeah. I was trying to get followers and eyes because I wanted to build a personal brand because I thought I had some things to talk about that were valuable to other people and some experiences. Which they are. I, I, I agree. And I, I think I've lost a bit of fire for it because I think there's a lot of voices. Um, I lost a bit of fire for it because I'm like, I'm just another, I'm just another noise in the, in the pack. Um, and so I, I care a lot less about what people think about what I have to say now, purely because I'm just like, I didn't give a, like, I'm just enjoying just talking about things that I've had experience with. Mm. So I think, um, the whole scenario about personal development that kind of, kind of bothers me a little bit is it's always about looking forward and it's never about, it's never about just yeah slowing the fuck down for a second so you can actually have some foresight. Yep. And it's always about what you're going to do tomorrow to be the most amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. And I'm just like, I'm just like, there's, there needs to be, there needs to be j- just to take a breath for a second. Cause I think life is for living, right? Yep. It's not always for progression. Yeah. And I, I think some people are genuinely just wired like that. Like I think you're Alex Samosis of the world. He is wired like that. Like he's, that is just his personality. I'm not like that. I'm not a dude who cares to grind and hustle every second of the day. I don't, care enough to do that which is the authenticity piece i was talking about before about you know like being who i am like i'm like i'm being okay with knowing that i don't have an alarm clock and i don't wake up at fucking sunrise nowhere near it actually like these kinds of things what if you had though a million people watching every youtube video of you providing value and input or insight into your journey through business and life yep. that then there were all young men that were then going when are you uploading your next video? Because you've changed, you are changing my life, and you're the beacon of fucking faith and hope that I hadn't had growing up. And I need to know what I need. What, what I need help with this problem. Yeah. Would you feel that that would deepen your obligation to actually show up more? It would. It would deepen my obligation to show up. Yes. Yeah. But it wouldn't change who I am. No. Because you can't sustain somebody else. Correct. You can only be who you are. Yeah. And sustain that. Yeah. And that's what I've learned. Like I. I can't sustain being a figure that talks anything differently to your life, how I feel and how I, how I think and those kinds of things. Um, and so like it would deepen my obligation. Yes. Yeah. I would absolutely like if, if I, I had purpose in that sense or I, I had, you know, I had that kind of um, reputation. Absolutely. Hmm. But I think you've got to earn that. And that's something that's like, you don't think you've earned it. Mate, if I had a million followers tomorrow, what am I done to earn that? I'll post a video for a week on YouTube for like two months, bro. Like, fuck. Like, I haven't. Earned yeah, that. but we haven't. But we haven't. We haven't shined light and consistent sort of preaching and, and conversations on your journey from the darkest pits of hell. That's you know, as Parkway Drive. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny Depp says the deserve for deserve for betrayers and mutineers, right? Yeah. Um, that was a full dead man chest um reference from Parkway Drive. Oh, I'll just say that. Um, Ooh, but, I love that. but, uh, yeah, no, I just think, but you hit the nail on the head there though, where you don't think that your journey is of any value. No, I didn't say that. Sorry. My interpretation was, I haven't earned it to do the, the, but the why reps. not? But w- no, I all the reps. I oh, right. Posted sorry. A video a day. I thought you meant what you've gone through has no merit. I'm no, like, no, no, no. right. You know how many young men probably are in the pit that you were in your, in your yeah. bedroom at your mum's that if you were just there, yeah, they would be like, oh. you'd be the lowest, you'd be the lowest mocker yeah. for them. And this is the thing. I'm not discounting that. Okay. I completely miss. That's, no, 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 I understand. Yeah, I appreciate it because yeah. I'm like, I think my journey is something I want to share, which I, which is what I'm doing. Yes, with this. yes. But I think it's, I think it's, and I, I mentored a young man. Yep, I mentored a young man, and I, I got him. He was in a very similar scenario to me, and now he's got his own agency, and he's, cool. and you know who he is. 
Oh yeah, yeah, you know who he yeah, is. yeah, 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 um, yeah. And like he he is he is my he's he was the purpose of like I, I got him to he was he was earning nothing with living with his parents unhappy and all those kind of things broke relationship and now he's got his own agencies you know crushing it he's That's sick it. and and like and like I took him from that position because I saw a lot of myself in him yep and I helped him through and it's like. Uh, none of that's been documented or anything like that. It's been up behind closed doors. Yeah, I did yeah, do yeah. content on Instagram every day for a year. Work with Tom Noski. Yeah, we, which we yeah. both. Yeah, he's mentored us both. Mm. And Tom, fucking legend. Um, and like I did all that stuff, but like what I was referring to is I haven't earned it in a sense of like I believe if you have a million something of anything, you've done years worth of that work to earn that. Yep, years. Yep, people don't see the years. They don't see the and years. and a young person that's listening that's starting out that's in their first ten k months twenty k heck even heck even even when I was hitting hundred k months I still didn't think I knew anything I still I don't, don't I still don't I still don't no and I'm like there is levels to the game that tracks too that is just that is one of the constants of everyone in business no matter how successful yeah you don't know you don't know shit you you still think you know nothing yep. Yeah, and the most disheartening uh, thing for young entrepreneurial men to see is exactly what you just said then is, hey, I will get you to here in this time frame if you just follow this. Yeah. And it's like, okay, but what about this whole entire 10 years you had as track record being an employee at that digital agency? Mm. What about when you had an e-commerce business and then you did drop shipping and then you did this and then you had digital products and then you did this and the med- there is so much of people's experience that contributes to the speed of what someone goes in a new niche new industry new model new product whatever that people just don't want to look at or oh, they, oh, they, Be- they completely what's the goal and it's the I think it's the it's the gold shiny object syndrome that people look and go what's the next best thing yeah I got caught in that man we've seen all these guys talk about well you're a big advocate for it too it's just like so, what was it? One of the one of my one of my clients messaged you and said, "Oh, hey, can you jump? Can we jump on the call and have a chat?" And it was about marketing. Yeah. And then you go, "I don't take calls." <laughs> yeah. It's true though. It's true. Yeah. And I'm like, I started to look at going. Well, I actually want to try and build a business where I can run all of my events and do everything that I do without having a conversation with someone. Mm. Someone slides in the DMs. They get a link. They they pay me. Yeah. And then they turn up. It's like I was looking then for other mentors and other ideas, and I was getting so distracted from other people's models. Yeah. Dan Bolton talks about it. Every model works. Everything. Everything works. And I'm like, well, my model works too. Yeah. But it's that I think it's the it's the the noise that you're talking about because everyone's doing something. Yeah. And I think as a young man. You need to find what you're good at yeah. and double the fuck down. Yeah. Until you then in a position where you have the capital to then bring other people in to do the things you suck at. Yeah. But until then, you've got to do everything. Yeah. And because you've got to do everything, you have to have so tunnel vision and laser focused on what is, um, how may you say, one, one, one marketing channel with one message to one niche with one offer for at least a year to hit a million. Mm. It's true, yeah. That's so true. It's, it's just basic. Yeah. Yeah. It's just basic. Yeah, like if you're talking about like starting and, and getting momentum and these kinds of things, mm. one of the best things I heard was you just got to eat some eat some shit sandwiches. Oh yeah, and you eat them every every day for a long time. Yeah, and like I think people wildly underestimate the volume that needs to be done to be able to get results. Yeah, especially in the early times, hundred times to, to push the push the snowball. Hundred times you're pushing that shit on flat ground. Oh yeah, uphill. Oh yeah, and until there's a little bit of a decline, then all yep. of a sudden it hits a wall. There's your grit. That's the grit, and it's choosing to keep going. And Homozi said only recently that there is a massive correlation between the physical fitness and the physical capability of a man and his success in business. Yeah, I believe that to be true wholeheartedly. Yes, there are men out there that are later in their years that aren't as physically fit and capable than what they would have been in their in their early 20s, late 30s. But I think if you are a man who's young, fit and fighting age male, which is the demographic of those that are truly under threat right now, 
I think you need to really evaluate, reevaluate how you show up physically. I have a big advocate for it, but I'm also the biggest culprit for how much I'm liking food, especially around you. <laughs> Three dinners later. Um, because I think if you're going to live on the edge, you still need to have the, the capacity to go above and beyond what you physically are capable of at times yep. and to push that envelope and to truly see what you're capable of. Mm. Because the, the, the reminder that you get when you are physically exhausted and you keep going, just like when people read the David Goggins and they're so inspired by it, or Ned running 10, 10 days for 146 Ks or something to break the record. Yeah. People are going to go, that's insurmountable. That's impossible. Yeah. But it it becomes possible when they when people actually do it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's like when, um, uh, was it um, Robert Bannister, when he ran the first minute, um, four minute mile? Yeah. It's like straight away, as soon as everyone thought it was impossible, then someone else, that, like heaps of people did it afterwards. And now, how fast do people run? That's insane. And I can't remember the book, but there was, um, with all the Olympians, with they're continuing to break records. And it's like, where do we actually truly know the end point of human capability? Yeah. Mm. I, I don't think, we're nowhere near it, I don't yeah. think. Like, there's so much we don't know about the mind and the body. 100%. But when it comes to men, I think you should take a real hard look at yourself and look at how you're showing up in that area. Yeah, 100%. Because it's, because I- Self-respect. And I, I look, this is probably, I wouldn't say shallow, but I was in a mastermind with, uh, it was a, it was a, a co-ed, mixed co-ed mastermind. Because um, my mastermind is only men. Yep. Right? And this mixed co-ed mastermind was business related. And it obviously has a lot of connections with life, relationships, wealth, etc. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to stay for a few reasons and re-sign. But the, one of the big reasons was, is I only had three guys in that 100 plus mastermind that I respected. And I just couldn't sit there and be amongst men that didn't have the same or similar values to me. Yeah. I just really, and Ed, the crazy thing is, this sounds weird, but the men that actually I respected were those that were, they they were killers. Yeah. Like absolute weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was amongst when we would sit at the table and you'd have those, you'd have lock eyes and you'd have that eye contact where you're just like, oh yeah, it's we're on. Yep. Like you could kill me if I pissed you off. Yeah. Um, and they've all had dark pasts too. And mm-hmm. I think that humility piece that we've spoken about, but of knowing how dark you've been and how dark you can be, the one element that men are so fearful of is that whole combative part of them yeah. that they've never exercised in a healthy way, that they truly don't know what they're capable of physically. Mm-hmm. And to, to be able to exert violence in a controlled manner, like we're talking about with jujitsu and mixed martial arts, I think there there's something healthy to say about all men should do it. Yeah. Or try it at least yeah. and see how you go. Yeah, I think that's why I loved the fact that my whole entire adult career was just driving armored vehicles and just bombs and guns. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like I was living the US dream lifestyle, yeah, but yeah. in the Australian army. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think um, health and fitness so that, is a must ha- with business. Health and fitness is a must. And I, I tell you what I love about this, yeah. this conversation is. This speaks to our yours and mine differences in a lot of ways, our mindsets in a lot of ways. Yeah, because because we do think differently about these sorts of things. Like I, my lens is entirely different to yours in how I see, how I see groups and people. It is, and like that's where I get things from you that I otherwise wouldn't, mm-hmm. and you get things where you are, where you otherwise wouldn't. Like, it's 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 that whole thing from Tony. <laughs> Timu, Timu, fucking lighters. Bro, you're going to burn your house down with that thing. And it's not even your house. 350 bucks. Nice. For this thing. Yeah. More for, for, the whole, for, for the whole for the whole set. Stupid. Um, yeah. We've spoken about a lot, so I think um, we could probably call it. Yeah. I think... Is there anything else you want to do? Um, I, I think it was just... We just wanted to touch on... Yeah. Find it. Look, I think for me, it's... 
find 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 your tribe of men where you share similar values in life, but with also different um, as p- outlooks and opinions where you can have healthy conversations to test and challenge one another in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. Be open for constructive criticism and understand that it's coming from a place of love. Understand that you need to be able to learn how to hold space for your your women by understanding how to process your own emotions when things come up that are triggered within you from them and to realize that it's something that you need to work on and not necessarily what they need to work on for them not to be the problem. It's within you as your shadow. I think you then need to be able to have a sense of grit and a sense of purpose and direction in everything that you aspire to do if you're wanting to be a man that's wanting to strive for more and achieve more. I think you need to look at the whole portion of loyalty, honor, self-trust, and um, integrity. And then moving forwards, live as close to the edge as you possibly can in everything that you pursue moving forwards in life and business and in physical fitness, but to also take that commander's pause in your a, a process, uh, in your ability to process emotions and also to fucking actually enjoy the fruits of your labor of what you are working so hard for. The grind and the pursuit of actually trying to achieve more all the time is draining and is taxing on you spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And if you're not going to sit down with your mate and just do random uh, side quests of like just doing a podcast episode, then what's the point of making the money? What's the point of actually doing anything worth hustling and grinding and sacrificing for if you're not actually going to experience it? So slow down to speed up. Take the pauses that you need to when you need to and have enough self-respect for you to take that break and to take that time. Because when you are so in the trenches, if I was to give you an analogy, military analogy, if you're in the trenches and you're constantly fighting and you're always reloading ammunition, you're not sleeping, you're not resting, you're not eating, you're not hydrating, but more importantly, you as the commander not actually stepping away from the front line to look at the map, listen to the radio and understand what's going on around you on the battle space, then you're actually going to lose sight on what it is you're fighting, who you're fighting against or what you're fighting for. And more importantly, you might be fighting the wrong fight. You might be fighting in the wrong direction. There might be something else that needs your attention, aka the fact that you're not present with your partner at home, the fact that you're not actually taking care of your health and fitness and you're just focusing wholly and solely on your business. That's the downfall is not to understand that the holy trinity of your health and your fitness, your relationship and your business are all in one. And the thing that underpins everything is your ability to lead. If you understand that everything is a leader-led problem in your life, your business and your relationship, then all of your problems that you have, you've created, but you're also in total control of it. So you can change it. And that's what I'd leave that on. Peace out.